please welcome Debbie Goddard to the stage. Hello. Oh, that's better now, I can't see you. No, I'm kidding. Hi. Thank you for having me again at this late date at the end of a conference, <laughs> like usual. No, whoa, wheels. Okay, don't do that. Uh, I'm gonna start by apologizing that I'm sick. Um, it's not con crud, it started before the con, but it's been evolving over time. Um, so I might need to make sure I mute myself and put snot in things or cough, and I apologize ahead of time for needing to do so. <clears throat> Hopefully it'll stay all right and I can talk. I'm excited about this presentation. There are so many things I could have talked about at the last minute, and fortunately I had some PowerPoints on my computer from earlier this year. This is a talk I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background so you know where I'm coming from on this before I get into the main subject. I did a lot of different kinds of activism in my life. Uh, I started in high school, but didn't really get involved with other people trying to take action for change until I plugged into the LGBTQ community in Philadelphia. Then I got engaged in rallies and demonstrations and vigils and you know, blocking off streets and a couple of other things holding signs outside of City Hall. I was also, through friends, tangentially involved in reproductive rights activism, some other progressive issues. And I found a lot of the time that my opponents, the people on the other side of the issues, from where I was, my cultural competitors, used, were ostensibly motivated sometimes by religion and what I thought was bad thinking and so I was very interested in studying philosophy so that I could teach critical thinking, thinking that if I could challenge that bad thinking, if I could challenge people's reliance on religion and what their ministers told them, then some of the issues that I was fighting so hard to advocate for would go away. And what secular opposition could there be to something like same-sex marriage, for example? When I learned that there was a free thought movement I got very, very excited that this is where I could put my activist energies to see change happen in the world, that here are people who are dedicated to promoting critical thinking and challenging religion. And so I, I moved all of my volunteer energy into that. And I thought that I could get better at that as a volunteer and then later as an employee at the Center for Inquiry in the outreach department. I thought I could improve my skill set by studying philosophy and studying things like the history of the Enlightenment and the philosophy of science, and I even subscribed to a word a day emails to improve my vocabulary, somehow conceiving that these things would help me become a better campus and community organizer. Because the people that I saw around me in CFI, in the Center for Inquiry where I work, and in conferences I attended, and even in the groups that I was a part of in Philadelphia, uh, the people who I saw on stage, the people who people were excited to see, the people who I heard were actually like the leaders of our movement, many of them were highly educated, scientists, philosophers, people who were skilled at debating, and so I thought those were the skills that I needed to develop if I wanted to be better at my job, better at being an organizer. It took me an embarrassing number of years to realize that you can actually study and learn more about how to be an activist, how to be an organizer, how to advance social change, build a social change movement, because I didn't see the people who were doing that on stage at conferences or highlighted in our magazines or whatever it might be. Uh, and this is going back, you know, 10, 15 years, I think a lot of that has changed now. Obviously, at this conference, we've seen that that's changed. Um, but I remember, the, like, figuring this out about maybe it was seven or eight years ago when someone said, oh, yeah, you can get a book that tells you how to do activism better. And I thought, what? There are books about this? 
I don't know if it was that, you know, I didn't see these courses in college, how to be an activist. I didn't see um, like um, someone who could major in that. And I wasn't plugged into the places where you could see that there are labor trainings and whatnot. So I was shocked that there was this whole body of knowledge uh, that people had, you know, centuries sometimes of data and evidence saying what it is that works and what doesn't work. And since then, I've been trying to learn from people who engage in this to listen more carefully, to employ some of the strategies that I've learned um, in my own activism. And it's helped me to become better and more effective, not just in my job, but in my life, in my, in my other activist and volunteer activities outside of working at CFI. And so some of those I, I've put together here um, and wanted to pass on and discuss because I think we could all improve at that. I've also had the benefit of, uh, I'm gratified to have been part of organizing leadership trainings at the Center for Inquiry in the summer, where we bring in local group organizers and campus group organizers, as well as labor organizers and animal rights activists and people with all kinds of backgrounds to teach people how to be better leaders, how to be better organizers, and how to be better activists. And I've learned from that as well. So we're good in this movement, in this broader community, we're good at tackling a lot of big ideas, right? Not all of them, not all of us, not all the time. But we're good at talking about big ideas. We have conferences about these things. We have magazines and books. We have local group discussion meetings. We're good at debating. We foster these environments for debate and presenting something and then defending your perspective uh, and having the integrity to take a principled stand on an issue and defend that perspective in places like Facebook. But we're not always good at taking these ideas out of the theoretical and putting them into the practical. We're not necessarily good at taking the idealism of how people should behave and be and think rationally or how we wished people behaved. But to be more effective as activists, we need to think pragmatically. We need to think strategically about what actions we should take to have an effect, and whether these actions are effective, if we could be engaging in different kinds of actions to have more of an effect to accomplish the kinds of goals we want to accomplish. Fortunately, we have data and evidence that can help show us what's effective and what's less so effective. We can do more thoughtful activism That didn't work. Let's try it again. All right, yes. Technology. Each person here is an activist. Each of us has the ability to change things. We don't exist in bubbles. Certain kinds of bubbles we do. We don't exist alone. We always interact with people online and in person. We can change things. And so this talk, this presentation is organized in two parts. To think about broader campaigns and individual ones. I don't need to explain, I think, here why activism is important and why we might be interested in changing the world. Do I? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Others have done that, we understand that. All right, let's get started then. I've done philosophy for too long to not want to start by defining my terms. So, what is activism? And there's no need to be fancy here. It's quite simply taking action to try to change something. There's different kinds of activism, political activism, social, economic, environmental. We can append a lot of different adjectives there, but there are a lot of similarities with when we think about how to do it effectively. I'm also talking about organizing, which is simply bringing people together for some reason. That could be organizing a picnic. I'm trying to get people together in one place for some event. It could be organizing an action. It could be organizing a community. But that's simply what that means. I'm an organizer. I work with getting people together in groups to do things. Easy peasy. 
There are a lot of words when you talk to organizers and activists, like mobilizing, empowering, leadership. Sometimes they have slightly different meanings than we might be used to. I'm not gonna get into that jargon um, in this. I'm not gonna cover all of the details of all of this. We don't have the time. It takes a long time to learn some of this, I think. And you won't remember it <laughs> if I make this an information-dense presentation. So instead, I'm going to try to focus on a couple of useful concepts that you can take with you that are ways to think about bigger picture activism campaigns and how we can improve individually as activists. These are things I've found very useful over time. I'm, I'm pausing sometimes to skip some of what I'm writ I've written because I know we started a little late and it's the end of a long and wonderful conference and people have drives that they need to do. So if I'm pausing, it's, do I need that paragraph? Nope. <laughs> you won't miss it. <laughs> So let's start by talking about campaigns, part one of two. What is a campaign? Campaign is a series of actions taken with the aim of creating change. You can think of it as a project. If you know what, like a project manager, what does a project manager do? They think about all the pieces that need to come together to accomplish some bigger thing, right? All the little tasks, the ways that different people need to have different responsibilities. That's what a campaign is. It can be very small, it can be very, very big. And of course, there are different kinds of campaigns. An advertising campaign might be, we need to sell more Mountain Dew this year. How are we gonna sell Mountain Dew? And you take things into account to try to sell more Mountain Dew. Obviously, election campaigns, which have a very defined uh, ending to the term when you engage in this campaign. There are longer campaigns, issue-based campaigns that we might think will never, we'll never win, but we can still advance the goals of the campaign. There are methods to making effective campaigns. It's very helpful to follow a framework, and a lot of organizers will talk in this kind of way using this framework, not always using the same words for the pieces of it. Uh, so you, the words that I'm using are the way that I'm used to thinking about it, but it's really the idea of how to think about a campaign, how to break it up into units that I wanna get across. So you start with your goals. You might say your vision. How, what's, what's happening? How do you want the world to be different? A lot of times your goals are reactive. Something is wrong and you need to do something to change it, right? Most campaigns, I say, most activist efforts are invested in reactive campaigns. Some are proactive. We think things could improve, the world could be different this kind of way. And also often it helps to make them be winnable issues even if you can't see when they might be something that's won, but not like everyone should own a unicorn. Actually, I shouldn't even say that because cloning will happen and then people have unicorns and I'll have to eat my hat, but <laughs> winnable, winnable issues. Under the vision or the main goal are your objectives. And these are the things that you and your group actually take on with the aim of actually creating change. There's often a primary objective that defines what you do. If you accomplish that, you've, you've, you're successful at your campaign. And then there are secondary objectives, and these can be sort of benchmarks that you accomplish along the way, you know, steps that help you get towards your campaign. Uh, you might wanna do evaluations every few months or something as you work on a campaign. They can be incremental gains. So there's not always just one objective, it's often good to make sure you have a primary so people are focused. After you determine what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish and change, then you think about your target audience. Who is it that has the power to actually affect this change? These could be key decision makers like politicians or business owners. It could be people that you need to count on to exert additional pressure like moms or doctors or students. Um, often you'll have multiple audiences, the media, but it's good to think about who you're trying to reach to accomplish your objectives. Who do you need to reach to accomplish those objectives? It's not often everyone. <laughs> it might be everyone who lives in the zip code is your audience. After you figure out who you need to talk to to accomplish your objectives, then you can start putting together and determining your tactics. 
Tactics are the specific actions you and your group take to achieve your objectives with that audience in mind. Do not forget the audience who has the power to make that change. They're the vehicles for your message. And I always include when I'm talking about campaign building, the step of evaluation. It's not just something you do after you're done. I think a good campaign should include evaluation as you build your campaign so you think about how you know whether you're successful. Are you looking at an increase in Facebook likes? Um, you know, the, the bill doesn't pass in the house. Um, you know, you hit a recycling rate in your community of 90%. Like, what does it look like? And then, as you're building a campaign, think about how these other steps, your tactics and your target audience get you towards that. And as you're doing your campaign, make sure you evaluate to see whether your actions are effective. You might need to change your tactics as you work, and there's no problem with that. Again, there are other steps that we can talk about, like how to determine your messaging, what are some good metrics for evaluation, but those are secondary to this important structure. And again, you don't need to use this exact uh, numbered outline. You can ask questions like this when you're thinking about activism. What's the dream? What are we trying to do? How can we do that? That seems insurmountable. How can we figure out like building blocks for, for changing that? Who do we need to talk to or affect in order to get this thing done? Okay, we need to talk to these people. What, what do we try to say to them? What do we want to say? What happens a lot of times in activism, and maybe Facebook comment threads sometimes, is that we start with tactics. We know that we can do a thing. We're angry and we don't want to take it anymore. And we know we can do a thing, so we do that thing without thinking about how much impact that thing might have. There might be ways, if we want to change an issue, if we're serious about making change, which I think we should be, there might be ways that we can spend our limited time and resources to have a higher uh, impact, more of an impact. I might say, I don't like that this psychic con artist is coming to my town, and I want people not to go see that psychic con artist or something. I just hate her. So I'm going to make a handout, and I'm going to hand it to everyone I know. Well, do you want to hand it to the people who are in line for the con artist? Do you want to hand it out ahead of time? You know, are you trying to get people to not buy a ticket? Are you trying to get people to just also hate this person? You know, these, these are questions that I would like us to ask so that our activism is more thoughtful and intentional, strategic, and therefore successful. So let's think about a couple of examples. I'll walk you through a an easy one that's actually in the skeptical activism manual that I'll talk to you about later. So the problem that exists is some parents in your community, let's say in my community, read on the internet that Wi-Fi is harmful for kids. And so they want to get the Wi-Fi out of the school. Oh, I should mute this one second. Glad I remember that. Um, <laughs> they want to get Wi-Fi out of schools and maybe also Starbucks while they're at it. And you think, heck no, my kid needs Wi-Fi in school. This is pseudoscience. Wi-Fi is fine. You know, you're reading BS. I'm angry about this. I want to do something about this. These parents are wrong. What's your goal then? Goal is don't get the don't let them take Wi-Fi away from the school. Who do you, or what are your objectives then? Your primary objective is persuade the school not to remove the Wi-Fi. Whatever the situation is, keep Wi-Fi. Secondary objectives is educate the parents so that they don't keep trying to challenge this, so that they don't keep trying to take Wi-Fi out of the school. All right, that's cool. We have two solid objectives. You need to talk to the school. You need to talk to the parents. Great, those are our target audiences. What do we do? Okay, so we need to talk to the school, the school board. They're the ones who have the decision-making power here. How do we talk to a school board? Go to a school board meeting. Write some letters. I'm not sure how else you talk to school boards. PTA, do they listen to them? Find your friends also to attend those meetings. You need to talk to the parents too. Maybe make a handout. Maybe make a website that you can send information to. 
Maybe you think of other ways to get the message out to the parents. Maybe you recruit some of your friends who are on your same side and they can talk to their friends who are also parents to get that done. Those are different tactics you can use to reach the target audiences that you need to reach to accomplish the objectives that you're trying to accomplish so that you can accomplish your goal. Does that make sense? Fun times, right? Yeah. Cool. Let me mention another one. This is a African Americans for Humanism billboard, or sorry, transit station ad that we put together a couple years ago. A campaign, one of the first big campaigns that I had a chance to work on with money and, and resources, and it was kind of freaky and I was a little scared. <laughs> and I think this is partly why I'm so committed to thinking about activism in this framework, because I think it will help us uh, communicate with each other, communicate with interested parties, and actually get this done, I believe, well. In 2011, we were contacted by a supporter and donor who was interested in um, atheist visibility campaigns, putting up billboards in different communities to tell people something about atheists. And he said, how about we put uh, billboards up in black communities for Black History Month? That's never been done before. We can use a historical black atheist with a quote. Do you like it? Let's do it in New York and Chicago and Atlanta and Dallas and all these other cities, DC. Uh, what do you think? I said, yeah, love it. Whoa, that's huge. The largest atheist billboard campaign of its time. Wow, okay, yes, let's do it. So how do we do this? Well, obviously one of the sort of tactics was already locked in. We're gonna put up billboards. That's what we're going to do. How did we figure out what to put on our billboard? This ended up being, there was some arguing back and forth. But let's start with the why. The why is to increase atheist visibility, to raise the profile of atheists, so kind of be positive, to show people that there are black free thinkers, non-believers, and we're doing it during Black History Month because we also wanna show that this is not foreign to black history, right? That we are there, we've always been there, we are part of this history. So we also teased out that we're putting these billboards up in different cities. Our target audiences are black people who are believers because we want to tell them, hey, there are black non-believers and it's okay, we're not weird. Another audience, black people who are non-believers, obviously. And a third was media. Because for billboard campaigns, it's good to get more than just the eyes on the boards themselves. You want people to report on that so people can read those articles that greatly extends your, your reach. So what did we do? What, were, was, what was our messaging? What were our tactics? First, we made sure to have a relatively soft message. We didn't say, there is no God, and black people think that. Nothing like that. We said, do you have doubts? about religion, you're one of many. We're out there, there are lots of us. Go to our website. We changed the content of the board so that it wasn't just a historical black freethinker with a quote. We put an image of a highly recognizable uh, black freethinker, and we also put an image of a modern living black freethinker, and we made sure to put an image of a person from that community. And because we were trying to get people plugged into the broader black humanist non-believer network, we got people who were affiliated with local groups and we got their group affiliation on that board. So there was a way for people to plug in. So this was one that was up in DC with Jamila Bay, who lives in DC. We have Frederick Douglass, a person who lives in DC. Jamila, the simple board, it ended up being relatively attractive, I think. I like, I like the way it looked. I'm biased. <laughs> and I think it was an effective message. Here's one with Alex Jules, pre-hair. <laughs> I was like, remember those days, Alex? <laughs> with a board that we put up in Dallas with Langston Hughes, which got more attention than everything else. I guess Dallas, Dallas has some stuff going on. <laughs> Here's one that was in Durham, North Carolina with um, 
Zora Neale Hurston, the third of the three faces historical people that we put on the board, and a Durham resident. We could say, look, we're, we're part of you. We're not weird. Um, we also wrote press releases for general media, and we damn sure made well to write press releases for black media. We also put together a website that was thematically connected, videos, same theme. We made a speakers bureau so that people could see spokespersons and the billboard representatives in their communities if they wanted to reach out to them. We put together a list of historical black free thinkers, again with that Black History Month connection, with descriptions of their activism as well as how we know they're a humanist or free thinker or non-believer. And we advertised the Day of Solidarity for black non-believers. All in all, with the framework we had, it became relatively easy to, to put pieces in and say, here's an action we can take that reaches our target audience. Should we do this or should we do that? We don't have infinity money, we don't have infinite time. Well, this reaches our target audience better, this gets us closer to accomplishing these objectives, let's do it that way. I think it worked pretty, pretty well for us. I have another example of a campaign that I don't have easy answers for. I'm not going to give you the answers or my perspective, but it's something to think about. Because part of what I want to talk to you about is that learning this kind of thinking, learning this kind of structure for how campaigns work, also helps us evaluate how other campaigns can work to really see if they're effective or not. And we don't always have full information. Let me mention that uh, quickly. But I remember people talking about things like the Occupy movement and whether it was actually a movement. What did they hope to accomplish? Where was the list of goals? Was it successful at that? And what most people said was, ah, oh, they're just sitting in a park. They don't, they don't even have one message. They don't even have a leader. That's an absolute failure. There are questions now about Black Lives Matter protests. Are they actually accomplishing anything? Well, if you come at it from this perspective of thinking about how campaigns work, what people are trying to accomplish, we see the, the tactics, we see some of the outreach. Do you know what it is that they're trying to accomplish? Is that information on a website somewhere? Can we evaluate if their tactics are working? How long term are those? Are there ones behind the scenes uh, goals for their campaign that we might not be aware of. So I think it helps us too to evaluate other people's, um, other movements work. But let me mention this campaign. Um, back in 2009, the Center for Inquiry launched the Campaign for Free Expression and International Blasphemy Rights Day. Not too long after that, uh, South Park was censored from showing an image of Muhammad. Do you remember this? And people were very angry about that. So there was an effort to have something called Draw Muhammad Day. And a lot of campus groups, not, not tons and tons, but a decent number of campus groups decided to chalk Muhammad figures on their campus. This one's from the University of Wisconsin-Madison group uh, from, I think, 2010 is when they did this. The Muslim Student Association wasn't happy with this. And so they took some of the Muhammads, put boxing gloves on them, and wrote Ali. So now it's Muhammad Ali, the boxer. <laughs> some of them they poured water on, some of them they scuffed out with their shoes. Uh, so the student group struck back by drawing more stick figures, some of them saying that the name of the stick figure was censored, other ones having a hangman style name, maybe part of the word Muhammad spelled out, not the full word, and then saying, is this okay? <laughs> now, I'm telling you what happened first with the South Park, uh, South Park being censored. And the tactic that we saw student groups engage in, which was drawing Muhammads, and some of the reaction to that. What I haven't filled in was the student group's rationale. 
I don't think that some of the groups that engaged in this thought about who they were trying to talk to, what message they wanted to communicate, how they would know that that's effective. So some of the feedback that this campaign got was that Ayan Hirsi Ali said that the protest was a, a positive campaign, quote unquote, that can, quote, promote self-reflection among Muslims, unquote. Uh, some said that engaging this campaign increased the number of blasphemers, so targets. In other words, if, if uh, probably Muslims got angry about this, they couldn't get everyone who was drawing Muhammad because now it was, you know, thousands and thousands of people are drawing Muhammads everywhere. They can't, can't stop them. Some said that it demonstrated solidarity. I wonder with, with who? They, they didn't say that. Some said it was offensive for no reason. Uh, and the student group leader actually wrote a passionate defense about the idea, the sort of integrity of, of standing up for what we believe in and engaging in this freedom of expression. Uh, we cannot tolerate limitations on our freedom of expression, he says. That's fine. I'm not gonna tell you what I think about that. What I'd like, us, what I'd like you to think about, though, and consider is, who are they talking to? Who, was, who were they trying to get this message out to? And what message were they trying to deliver? Was it all Muslims? Was it the Muslim students on their campus? Was it the general campus body? Was it sort of society as a whole? And what was that message that they were trying to deliver? And for some who might be uncomfortable with it, because there, were, there was some criticism of this campaign, um, what might you have done differently? So learning these kinds of frameworks can help us work on these and evaluate these kinds of efforts and help us shape our own activism to be effective. How can you learn more about campaigns? This is the beginning part. Read about other movements, of course. Read about feminist history. Read about LGBTQ activism. Go to talks by amazing people like Ingrid Nelson and Rebecca Hensler when they do workshops on this stuff. You know? <laughs> Read about the labor movements, the civil rights movement, you know, and we do, we do talk about these discussions. Is this effective, isn't it? Firebrand versus diplomat, that's, that's a discussion about strategy and tactics, right? Who are we talking to? What does it accomplish? Are, do we have the same goals in these efforts? Uh, we can also learn from political campaigns and from advertising campaigns. You know, how do you target an audience effectively? If you're targeting, um, AARP members, should Facebook be your primary tool? Actually, nowadays, probably. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I was trying to think of a good stereotype that would suggest that maybe not Facebook, but yeah. I like talking about Mountain Dew because their campaigns are so obvious, like who it is that they're trying to sell Mountain Dew to. So that's, that's the campaign format, the way that I think it's good for people to think about campaigns and organizing and activism. Before entering the second part of this talk, I wanna highlight one point, I wanna make one point very explicit, which is that as activists, our medium is people. The goal of activism is to persuade people to change their attitudes, to change their behavior, sometimes to change their values. In organizing, we try to bring people together to do something. For both, our medium is people, whether it's the people we're working with to try to get things done, or the people on a different side of the issue than the side we're on. And the funny thing about this is that the working with people and trying to do good for people is what makes this so rewarding because we're trying to take steps to make the world a better place for people. But it's also what makes this so damn frustrating, both within our communities and in the fights that we engage in because people are frustrating and people are aggravating and sometimes we just can't stand them. But that's also what drives us to be activists and to do good. So, let's make the world a better place. 
The second part is thinking about the fact that our medium is people. Brains are not so smart. They are squishy meat bags in our heads. We like to think that people are reasonable. We like to think that people make careful decisions after considering the available evidence. I have the feeling that in this community that may be especially true, both for the way that we see ourselves and the way that we see others, that if we bring enough data as well as a good argument that brains should accept that as true in the way the world is. But research shows that many decisions that humans make <laughs> that we think are so carefully reasoned and backed up are actually the result of complex emotional and social influences and many of our choices are simply the result of habit. But we're very, very good at justifying our conclusions after they've been drawn. All right, I'm gonna blow my nose. I feel like these viruses are the result of complex social influences. Ugh. <laughs> Emotions, feelings, these things play a huge role on the decisions we make. And as activists, we need to remember that. We need to know that what we're trying to do is somehow persuade people to change their behavior, their values, their beliefs, their attitudes. And we need to recognize, therefore, how people actually work, not just how we wish they worked. If we want to be better at things like logic and critical thinking, we know that we can study logic and critical thinking. We can study how to debate better. If we want to be better at persuading people to shift their attitudes and change their behavior, we need to pay attention to fields like psychology and marketing, which has tons of data about how to get people to change their behavior. And feels like sociology, things that study people and how people actually work. In each of these fields, there's a lot of information about what works to help change people's minds and what doesn't work. So let's talk about psychology a bit and what we can learn from things like social psychology to be better activists. I'll start with a small example. In 2008, there was a study that got a lot of attention that showed that not only do people associate warm people with warm feelings, like feeling warm, but also people associate warm feelings with warm people. So I'll explain. The researchers invited people in for a study and would hand them either a cup of a hot beverage or a cold beverage, just to hold for a minute while the researcher filled out some things. And then the researcher had them fill, uh, read a short story, some narrative, and then write down what they thought were the sort of personality characteristics of the character they read about. They didn't tell the person that the study was actually about the beverage they were holding. So the people who held the warm beverage tended to rate the character they read about as warm. And the people who held the cold beverage tended to rate the characters they read about as cold. And this is so ridiculous. This is so silly. And when I read these things, I laugh, and I also want to cry. <laughs> because I'm like, no, that can't be how we work, is it? Ah, oh, that's so silly, that can't be. <laughs> Obviously, right? But. It also affected, they did more of these studies, they've done several of them over the decades. They also found that these holding different things of different temperatures affects your selfishness. So in another study, people were asked to hold a therapeutic pad, either a heating pad or a cooling pad, to evaluate the product. And then they were asked, for doing this work, for evaluating this product, they could either get a gift card for themselves or a gift card for a friend. The people who had the cold pad were more likely to engage in the selfish behavior of keeping the gift card for themselves. And the people who had the warm pad were more likely to get a gift card for a friend. Ah. Ah. 
And this, <laughs> this is called priming. And in some level, we, we completely understand and accept that this is the way that people are. You know, if, if you want to ask your boss for a raise, and you're like, Tuesday, I'm going in on Tuesday to ask my boss for a raise. And that day, your boss is late, you know, her car broke on the way into work, she had a flat, it was cold and rainy, everything's miserable, she missed a meeting, she has a toothache, then that's probably not the day you want to ask for a raise. We know that, right? Is that irrational? Yes. Are people irrational? Yes. So I think we need to accept that this is how we are and let this inform the way that we do activism. One of my favorite, <laughs> it's good, I'm gonna cough before I do this so that I can, I can tell you this great story. Thank the flying spaghetti monster for mute buttons. <clears throat> so, this is one of my favorite things. A group of scientists at Newcastle University conducted a field experiment. So imagine this. They're at a university. They're persuasion researchers. They look at social psychology. And they notice that the cafeteria gets kind of junky sometimes. People don't pick up after themselves. So they think, well, what if we put posters up, maybe with eyes or something on them? Do you think that would affect people's behavior? So for a month they counted, they measured how much people left their trays behind on the table after they ate in the cafeteria. And then for the next month, they changed the different posters they put up in there. And sometimes they put up neutral things like flowers. And at other times they put up images with eyes. And then they saw, did this change people's behavior? When they put up pictures with eyes, twice as many people cleaned up after themselves. But that's not all. The researchers thought, cool, that's great. What if we tried that in our break room? And so in their university break room, there was a, an honesty box where there's coffee and like snacks and they, ask, they just have a box and they ask people to put money in so that they can buy more coffee and snacks. They trust people to contribute enough to do this. And so the researchers put up flowers some days, and on other days they put up eyes. People paid three times more when there were images of eyes up than when there were images of flowers or something. But there's more. And also, I can't believe that this is what researchers do. <laughs> like, I'm in the wrong line of work. I want to put eyes on everything. <laughs> So there was a bike rack, and they're like, huh, we know that bikes get stolen from this rack. What if we put eyes on it? Let's try that. So they put up the sign, Cycle Thieves, we are watching you, it says, and it has a picture of eyes. Thefts at that bike rack went down 62%. So I know this is, this is oh man, so frustrating though, right? So silly. But we have data. This is evidence-based. This is... As far as social psychology goes, like, we have good information that this is a thing that has an effect on people. What can we get from this as activists? Well, if I want to start a recycling program at uh, a company, there hasn't been one. People are just used to throwing all of their, everything into a trash can at the end of the day. And now I want to put big blue recycle bins next to that and have people separate their trash. I know it's hard to change people's habits. Maybe I want to put up a sign with some eyes on it, and be like, you should recycle. <laughs> this, will, this will have an effect. There's a lot of different ways that we can use this information to help accomplish our goals, to, help, to make an impression on people so they change their behavior. We know people get in habit ruts. It's like one weird trick. Put some eyes on it. Speaking of weird tricks, did you notice that I'm showing here like all of the information about these different studies and I don't expect you to be able to read any of that? All the publication data? Do you know why I did that? Because it's science-y. 
And people are more likely to believe information that looks sciency or things that have charts in them. So if you don't believe me on that, check this out. This says when things have charts, <laughs> you're much more likely, this is actually a real study too, you're much more likely to believe it. <laughs> Check that out, the gray bar, no chart, the big reddish bar, chart. See how much different that is? Obviously, it's true. And other things, I mean, check this one out. No chart, smaller than with chart. People more likely to believe charts. And this is actually the same information as was presented in the previous graph, just in a different direction. And also with it going to the tenth uh, decimal place here, much more believable, right? You're convinced. And if you thought, no, I'm not convinced, I like science, I'm a critical thinker. I won't be fooled by these kinds of things, right? Guess what? <laughs> Researchers <laughs> asked subjects to rate their agreement with the statement, I believe in science, on a scale of one to nine. One means not very much, nine means tons and tons. And the people who said that they believe in science more strongly were more likely to believe anything that had a chart or sciency looking data on it. <laughs> right? Ah, bring it down. It's, it's ridiculous. And I, I'm mentioning this partly because in the interest of, of time, I'm not gonna show you all of the data or bring up everything to um, defend each of my, uh, the points I'm making, but if you want to, it's out there, um, Googleable, or you can hit me up, email me, and I can happily send you stuff, but I'll also have some links at the end of this talk for further information. So I'll mention a few other ones very quickly that we can learn from as activists. Foot in the door technique. If you ask people to do one small thing for you now, they're more likely to do a bigger thing for you later. If you're trying to get, for example, lawn signs in a neighborhood to promote a candidate or say, repeal uh, House Bill 51, a lawn sign is a pretty big commitment. <laughs> you probably won't have too much success if you just go knocking on doors and say, hello, I support this thing, would you please put this on your lawn? But if you ask them instead for a small commitment, hello, you know, I'm trying to get people to uh, show their commitments to this thing, can you put this sticker on your window in your house, a two by three sticker? A larger number of people will do that. And then you come around two or three weeks later and say, Hello, I have these lawn signs, and I see you're a supporter of this position. Would you like to put these lawn signs out on your lawn? Many more people will do so, because they've already shown themselves that they are a supporter of this thing. It's part of their identity. So we see this with donation campaigns. They'll say, donate $3. And you think, what does that $3 do? Well, that $3 makes it much more likely that you're going to donate more money later. That's, that's what $3 does for campaigns. So that's a foot in the door technique. If you get people to engage in a behavior in some direction, they're more likely uh, to engage in similar behaviors in the future because now that they've built this as part of their identity. You may have heard a couple years ago about the backfire effect. An experiment was done where participants were given articles with false information, like WMDs were found in Iraq or uh, the Bush tax cuts increased government rev revenues. Both of those statements, by the way, are false. Or that the Bush administration imposed a total ban on stem cell research. So they gave people articles that included this information and then immediately after gave them a correction and said, actually, that part is not true. And what they found was that people were much more likely Many people were much more likely to double down on the wrong information if it was in line with their identity. So conservatives or Bush supporters, when presented with something false and then told a correction, would more strongly believe the false thing because now they're, they were challenged on something that was already in line with their identity. Ooh, pretty freaky. That goes into social norms. This is another one of my favorites. This is what's in my hotel room. Hang your towels. 
You've probably seen these if you've stayed in any hotel or motel anywhere. Basically, help the environment. By simply reusing your towel, you'll conserve water and energy. So a persuasion researcher, which is a job I'd really like to know how to get. It's just, I want to do things like this. Or hang out with them over drinks or something. A persuasion researcher worked with a hotel and said, I'd like to try some different messaging to see if we can increase your towel reuse. Now, why do hotels actually want you to reuse your towel? Yeah, it saves them money, it saves them energy, right. It's not like they're like, oh, the environment. They're like, oh, less washing of towels. Pretty good. So they're already giving you a certain kind of messaging here to try to affect your behavior. Well, this persuasion researcher tweaked the message for some of them and said, reuse your towel. Most people in this hotel reuse their towel. 68% of people in this hotel reuse their towel. That increased towel reuse by 26%. Because there's now an expectation. This is what people who stay here do. I am staying here, this is what I'll do. The researcher tweaked it again and found that if they were even more specific about the group that you're now in and said, please reuse your towel. 72% of people in room 306 have reused their towels. Then towel reuse rates increased to 30% more than they were otherwise. Again, ridiculous. <laughs> so it has to do with social expectations. You can actually motivate people to take action by letting them know that other people like them are doing that thing. A recycling program in Austin, Texas said, 72% of Austinites recycle. That applies the pressure, that sets a norm. Most people do this, you should do this too. If you said only 16% recycle and we want to change that, then when you don't recycle, you're like, well, no one really recycles, right? So that's a way that we can communicate information to get people to change their behavior. The last uh, one weird trick <laughs> I'll mention is this about social identity. To point out partly that this is not just related to ignorance, because a lot of times we'll hope that if we can just get the data and the evidence to people, that they'll see the truth and they'll change their mind if they're wrong or they'll, they'll change their behavior. If we can just communicate the data, right? But that's not what we see most of the time. In fact, it's often the people who are more scientifically literate who are better able to rationalize their perspectives and more stubborn and less willing to change on them. And this has to do a lot with identity and minimizing cognitive dissonance and things. So one area that uh, a researcher I adore is doing a lot of um, research is in attitudes about climate change. We have pretty clear data about climate change, but the way that people believe in it or don't believe in it is also tied to whether they're conservative or liberal whether they're religious or not religious, there are a lot of different aspects. So imagine this. A businessman in your town is making some decisions about a new place to dump sewage or cut down trees, maybe cut down trees, okay? And you love the trees so much. And you go in, you set up a meeting with the businessman to say, hey, your actions cutting down old growth forest in Alberta, that's going to affect the climate. And that's really bad, man. Because the trees, the trees are going to die. And you're wearing a t-shirt and it's like, love the trees, and some Birkenstocks, and your dreadlocks. And you're like, yeah, it's trees, man. Like, I'm trying to tell you, like, can't you just imagine their screams? And this businessman is like, what? the heck? Okay, thanks. Have a nice day. Get out before I call security. And you're like, no, but look at this graph. This shows climate data from the last thousand years. We've had the warmest years on record, man. Like, don't you see? It's undeniable. And he says, well, I don't believe in climate change. Like, that's, get out of here. This is, this is data. This is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to never, it's hard to say data is plural. Star Trek's ruined me. These are data. Fine, no. Uh, and he won't accept that from someone that he doesn't believe shares his values. 
This person who comes in and is challenging his identity and saying something's wrong with you, you're bad, check out this data. Well, whether this is true or not, that businessman is not likely to accept it. So what you need to do as the dreadlocked hippie tree lover with Birkenstocks is find your friend who has the Republican haircut and the nice suit and the nice watch and send your friend in with the talking points to go meet with the businessman and say, hello, sir, oh, it's great to meet you. Thank you for making some time with me. Oh, is that a picture of your kids on your desk? Oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to starting a family. I, I live with my niece and my uh, sister, and yeah, it's just such a joy watching them grow up, isn't there? Yeah, and that actually relates to something I wanted to talk with you about. You see, I'm very concerned about the climate, and I'm concerned about the kind of world that we're making for our children my future children, my sister's children. And I know that you care about you know, your family and you wanna make sure that they have a good life. It's one reason I'm sure you're such a successful businessman. This allows you to create the kind of life uh, for your kids that, that's you know, the best kind of life they can possibly have. And so, if you would, um, I'd like to show you this. Check this out. This is going to have an effect on a lot of companies' bottom line. Things are going to be more expensive for big companies like yours. So the things that you're hitting are the values that he shares, family is important, bottom line is important, right? Now check out this data. That makes him much more likely to accept this information. And it kind of sucks because it means that it's more effective for us to put certain kinds of mainstream presenting and mainstream identity people out to communicate with the other side, people we're trying to persuade. Sometimes that's the most effective thing that we can do, to play down difference, not to mention religion, not to mention political differences. But that's how people often work and sometimes that's how activism can get, certain kinds of activism can get things done. So those are social, that has to do with social identity. So in conclusion, I know I have to wrap up and I jumped over a couple different things. I want to point you in the direction of some other resources uh, that you can tap into in the future. The campaign outline that I presented is in this skeptical activism campaign manual, which was put together by a few people including Maria Walters, Desiree Schell, who's a labor organizer, and K.O. Myers, who is a lawyer. You can find that online, downloadable as a 72-page PDF, I believe, for free. It also has information about how to reach the media effectively, how to do evaluation well, um, how to do PR, um, more information about uh, tactics, metrics that you can develop, things like that. A big thanks to them. Desiree is the one who pointed out to me that I could actually read books about how to do activism better. I was just like, what? <laughs> That's incredible. Another book that I found really handy is this by Nick Cooney. It's called Change of Heart, What Psychology Can Teach Us About Spreading Social Change. And things like the foot in the door method or social norms, those are all in there with tons and tons of detail about the studies and uh, the history of different movements that have used them to make an impact. His main field is animal rights activism. Um, and a few years ago, we invited him to a leadership conference, not knowing whether or not he was an atheist. Uh, so we said, well, this is what we are, but we want you to teach our people how to do activism better, how to use this to do activism better. Turned out he was an atheist, so that was good. And he loved us, and we loved him. And he's got some talks online, too, where he really goes into this better to think about how we can be better activists, more thoughtful activists doing more strategic activism. This fellow, Dan Kahan, is a part of the Cultural Cognition Project at Yale. His website has a lot of resources, particularly, again, about climate change, social identity, social norms, uh, differences in thought between, or in thinking styles between conservatives and liberals, things like that. Some of it's very dense uh, to get through. There are also a couple of good videos online of him presenting uh, research on these things. And the last uh, reference I'll give is this called Stir It Up, Lessons in Community Organizing and Advocacy by Rinku Sen, which is an overview of how groups work and how movements work. And that includes you know, suffrage movements and uh, Malcolm X, MLK, Saul Alinsky, all of this kind of group activism things, labor, 
um, Chicano rights movement. It seemed to be a good overview which could point you into many, many, many more resources about how to do activism, which I think we all need to be thinking about. So, in conclusion, I really do believe activism is important and necessary and when Lauren contacted me and presented the option to give a talk here, even though I was sick and sort of grumpy, <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if my voice will hold up, I don't wanna cough on the mic and then have it pass off to someone else and it's just germs. <laughs> but we had this election, this is an amazing conference with amazing speakers and passionate people who can really make a difference where they live and where I know it's likely that all of us are engaging in different ways to shift people's behavior, attitudes, values, beliefs. And there are ways that we can do that better and learn how to do that better, myself included. So I was interested in doing something that could help us think more broadly about how to learn to do this better, how to take more effective action, because hell, we really need it. So I hope that seeing some of this information is, is just another step or for some maybe the beginning um, and that we're still open to learning from a lot of different sources and thinking about how understanding things like psychology better can help us be better activists. So if we're thoughtful activists and strive to think and act strategically, each of us can be much more effective at shifting culture and in doing that, we change the world. Thank you.